Well, hello, friends, and welcome to episode 214 of Stand Up. Joining me today, Dr. Jason Johnson and Dr. Megan May. I'm Pete Dominic, and it's time to stand up with me right now. All right, we are off. It is Tuesday night as I tape this, the 20th of October. What does that mean? There's 13, 14 days left until the election. It is really going to be, is it going to be the longest two weeks of the year of our lives? What is going to happen? All signs are pointing to Joe Biden winning on election night. But all the experts are cautioning us. We might not know on election night. There could be all kinds of different challenges. My wife is still convinced that Donald Trump is going to win for the record, as are many of you. Hard to take your eyes off the election and the news being made around it each and every day, as well as all we are hearing about the spread of COVID in our country. Here is Matt Kaiser from his daily email, WTF Just Happened Today. His Today in One Sentence reads, Mitch McConnell warned the White House not to strike a coronavirus relief deal before Election Day. The coronavirus has caused about 299,000 more deaths in the U.S. than would have been expected in a typical year. The CDC issued new guidelines that all passengers and workers on planes, trains, buses, and other public transportation wear masks to control the spread of the coronavirus. The Supreme Court allowed Pennsylvania to count mail-in ballots that arrive up to three days after Election Day. And the Commission on Presidential Debates will mute the microphones of both Trump and Biden. And the Justice Department argued that Trump's denial of a rape allegation was an official presidential act and he should not have been sued personally. That is Matt Kaiser. WTF just happened today in one sentence. So as you can see, a lot is packed in there. I've got a few audio clips to share with you, or you can skip right ahead and get to my awesome conversations with Dr. Jason Johnson, Dr. Megan May. Also want to give shout outs to new subscribers this week. Let me do that right now. Get that taken care of. And thank you everybody who is supporting the podcast with a paid subscription. Excited to see I, I, I had an audit done of the podcast as I'm looking to start to reach out to some organizations to work with and sponsor the podcast which I'm really excited to announce a couple good things in the works because we've got a lot of people listening now. And this, my friend who took a look at it, I'm loath to look at ratings. I think I said this on yesterday's podcast, but in case you missed it, top 10% of podcasts in America, which is pretty big. I mean, I think that puts me in the top 10 million because there's like a billion podcasts, but it's going really well. I'm very excited about it. I'm working really hard on it. I'm producing, booking, editing, and promoting the whole thing myself and of course hosting it. And I'm loving it. I'm really enjoying it. It's a lot every day, but I'm figuring it out and getting excited to do all kinds of new and interesting things with it and building this great community around it. If you haven't signed up for a paid subscription, you ought now because you can be a part of our Discord platform. We'll be watching the debate together. I should announce that. Debate night. When is that? Thursday night, right? Yeah, Thursday, the 22nd, 9 to 1030 p.m. East, Belmont University in Nashville, Uh, Kristen Welker will be the moderator. She's an NBC News White House correspondent, co-anchor of today's weekend. And there is already controversy about that debate with the microphones. And Trump campaign is complaining that they're changing the rules on the subject, which is apparently not the case. I don't know. I've been following that that closely, but I will have a debate party, a debate Zoom hang. And all of you new subscribers, I hope to meet you there. Always Welcome to join us, and I should just announce election night Zoom as well, election night hangout as well. I plan to be drunk November 3rd through the 5th. I haven't had a drink in 20 days, so I'm uh, I'm looking forward to partying with big Joe Biden win with all of you, and I hope that you will sign up now for a subscription to be there. You don't want to be alone on election night, and you're probably going to be because of the COVID. So join us now, and welcome to all the new subscribers, including Rachel Morris, who just subscribed for $5. Colin Engel became a $5 subscriber. Patrick Morrissey supporting the show for $10. M. Cox just became a subscriber for $5. Mark Baker, I see you, Mark, just editing his pledge. You can always edit your pledge up 
from five to ten dollars. Wallace Green just became a ten dollar subscriber, and Kathy Hira, or is it Hira Kathy, just also sub- su- subscribed. I can't speak. I'm not editing that out or editing that out. I'm not editing anything. Patreon.com slash Pete Dominic is where you subscribe. Patreon is a great subscriber service. You can support your favorite artists and performers and journalists and musicians and creators at Patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. That's mine. Or you just go to the show notes wherever you're listening to the podcast and sign up at the paid subscription link. And if you get a chance, go to wherever you listen to podcast. If you're not listening on the Patreon app and give the show a review, will you? Thank you very much. All right. Welcome to all the new subscribers. Hope to see you at debate night on election night. And you're never alone when you are part of this community because we have an awesome Discord hangout as well. Discord is a platform. It's kind of like Facebook or or Slack or texting or FaceTime all combined. A whole bunch of people always in there. You can light it up anytime and say, hey, how's everybody doing? I'm uh, kind of on a downward spiral. Where are you at? Or, hey, look, I just made a cake. It's a so many amazing people that are part of this community and you get access by becoming a subscriber. So do it now. We're almost to 800. We need like 40 more subscribers. We'll get to 800. My big goal is 3000 subscribers in this community. I cannot wait till COVID is dead and we're all going to meet at uh, listener Mitch's house, Brian Mitchell, Mitch, as I call him down in Florida. He's got a whole compound down there with turtles and coconuts and, uh, it's going to be awesome. We're going to have a great party. I'm looking forward to that, and uh, hopefully you'll meet us there. I know it's Florida, but it'll be awesome. Okay. I kid Florida. Everybody living there. Thank you for your support, guys. Now, let me get to a couple of other things I certainly want to mention. Uh, there's a big uh, news story about Donald Trump's taxes. The New York Times has again dropped another story, this one about tax records that show that President Trump had pursued expansive business projects in China for years and even maintained a Chinese bank account. New York Times reporting this yesterday, Tuesday. Disclosures that deal a blow to the president's efforts to paint Joe Biden as the presidential candidate who's soft on China. Oh my God, the president had accounts in China and apparently he paid more in taxes to China Then he did to the U.S. An analysis of Trump's tax records by the New York Times show the president holds a previously unreported bank account in China, not included on his public financial disclosures because it was held under a corporate name. He also maintains bank accounts in Britain and Ireland, but the Chinese account the newspaper said is controlled by Trump International Hotels Management. It paid $188,561 in taxes in the country from 2013 to 2013. 15. So while the tax records don't show how much money moved through Trump's foreign accounts, the IRS mandates that uh, filers disclose these portions of income when they come from foreign countries. And uh, apparently they didn't or they only reported a few thousand dollars from China. So this is another major story coming out of the New York Times. They've got his taxes and they are uh, unleashing these stories every week now. And it's uh, it's a big deal that Trump paid $188,000 in taxes to a communist country. And that is the line at the top of the Drudge Report. 37 million Americans have already voted. How about that? That's pretty interesting. Apparently, the president shot himself in the foot by telling his own supporters not to vote by mail. And so they listen to him because it's a cult and they listen to whatever the hell he's telling them to do, even when it doesn't make sense for him. And everybody else is mailing their votes in. Iowa now leaning to flipping blue. Democrats have now a 75 percent chance of taking over the Senate, according to 538.com. And even Frank Luntz is blasting the Trump campaign as the worst he has ever seen. All right. And we heard from former President Obama today. He tweeted this video out two minutes. I like the president. I love former President Obama. As a matter of fact, plenty of things to criticize about the guy. But uh, I really I really like him. I thought he did a great job. And here is a two minute video that he made to get us a little fired up, a little inspired. Make sure that everybody gets out and vote. Former President Obama on Twitter. Hey, everybody. One of the most inspiring things about this year has been to see so many young Americans fired up organizing, marching, and fighting for change. Your generation can be the one that creates a new normal in America, one that's fair, where the system treats everybody equally and gives everybody opportunity. We can come out of this moment stronger than before. Voting doesn't accomplish that on its own. 
But we can't accomplish that without voting. I know there's plenty out there to make people feel cynical. And plenty of people are going to seize on that to convince you that your vote doesn't matter. It's not new. It's one of the oldest voter suppression tactics there is. What is new is a growing movement for justice, equality, and progress on so many issues. This is really a tipping point, and that momentum only continues if we win this election. In times as polarized as these, your vote doesn't just matter. It matters more than ever before. And to change the game on any of the issues we care about, Joe Biden needs your vote. I know Joe better than almost anybody. I trust him to be a great president. He's different. He's on the right side of the issues. He'll get the job done. And Joe and Kamala will want you to keep pushing them to get the job done. Participate and vote. It's not always pretty. Trust me, I know. But it's how, bit by bit, we've made progress over the generations. And it's how your generation is going to change the game entirely. Go to IWillVote.com to make your plan. Then get some friends to join you. Let's go win this thing. All right, I want to share that with you, and you can share that on your social media if you think it's going to be effective. I think it's good when he comes out and says nice things. It reminds us what a normal president, a great president, he was more than normal, I think, is like and what normal times could be like. Speaking of inspirational, uh, on the World Series, during the World Series last night, the Biden campaign released uh, a great ad with like the, the, the best voice over actor and great actor overall, Sam Elliott, narrating this inspiring message over these wonderful images. You got to see it of America. Here is Sam Elliott. And I think this ad made its debut on the World Series during the World Series last night. There is only one America. No Democratic rivers. No Republican mountains. Just this great land and all that's possible on it with a fresh start. Cures we can find. Futures we can shape. Work to reward. Dignity to protect. There is so much we can do if we choose to take on problems and not each other. And choose a president who brings out our best. Joe Biden doesn't need everyone in this country to always agree. Just to agree, we all love this country. And go from there. I'm Joe Biden, and I approve this message. Well, what do you think of that? Was that unifying? Was that inspiring? Speaking of unifying and inspiring, here is a an ad or, yeah, that went pretty viral yesterday with... The two guys that are running for governor in the state of Utah making a joint ad. And even though one of these guys is way ahead, uh, Cox is his name. It's always a it's a rough name. They still came together to make this ad. And it's sad that this is where we're at. But it was inspiring to a lot of people. And. I wanted to share it with you. I'm Chris Peterson. And I'm Spencer Cox. Ugh. We are currently in the final days of campaigning against each other to be your next governor. And while I think you should vote for me. Yeah, but, but really you should vote for me. There are some things we both agree on. We can debate issues without degrading each other's character. We can disagree without hating each other. And win or lose in Utah, we work together. So let's show the country that there's a better way. My name's Chris Peterson. And I'm Spencer Cox. And we, we approve, approve this message. message. All right, guys, we get it. You're nice guy. They're Mormons. Mormons are always like really, really nice people, except for the some crazy pernicious beliefs that they have that were pretty anti-gay and anti-black for a long time. But anyway, uh, Mormon people, you meet them. They seem pretty nice. Those guys that went viral yesterday it was racked up more than like 700,000 views in the first five hours it was posted. And Chris Alyssa who writing over at CNN about this says that obviously there's a bit of novelty effect in an ad like that. You don't often see the two major party nominees for governor appearing in an ad together this close to an election or really ever. But I think there's more to it, too. What is on the display in Utah ad is an antidote to Donald Trump's view of politics and human nature. According to the current president, people who disagree with him are losers and idiots. They hate America. They're evil. 
This worldview is fueled by anger, resentment, and personal pique. It's exhausting, and the public feels it. Agree or disagree with Trump, it's hard to argue the fact that the last four years have felt a lot longer than four years. What reveals itself in the Utah ad is a glimmer of hope, Chris Alyssa writes. A sense that politics doesn't have to be the way Trump has conducted over the past four years, that reasonable people can disagree and can do so without being disagreeable. More importantly, that regardless of our political affiliations, we have a lot more in common than Trumpism would like us to see. What do you think of that, Utah ad? And uh, what do you think of this? Uh, Pat Robertson is still alive and still saying things and using this weird Crooked fingers at pointing, and I just play this for your entertainment and to remind you that there's like millions of people that actually watch this guy and believe this guy, and he's a horrible, horrible guy, and somehow he is still alive. There's going to be a war. Ezekiel 38 is going to be the next thing down the line, then a time of peace, then maybe the end. But nobody knows the day or the hour when the Lord's going to come back. He said the angels don't know it. And only the Father knows it. So I'm not saying this is the second coming, but I am saying there are things that people have thought <clears throat> would be during a millennial time with the coming of Jesus that are going to happen in our lifetime. And uh, the next thing is the election that's coming up in just a few weeks, at which time, according to what I believe the Lord told me, the president is going to be reelected. I'm, not, I'm, I'm saying by all means, get out and vote, to, vote for whoever you want to vote for. But by all means, let your voice be heard. But it's going to lead to civil unrest of a great proportion. Then a war against Israel and so forth and so on. And so forth and so on. Guy just makes shit up, just writes shit and then predicts it and says God is talking into his sweet old ears. And it's crazy because what's going to happen if Trump loses that he'll still have a show, he'll still have credibility, everything that he predicts and any of these assholes predict never happens. And yet people still follow them. I wonder if that will be the case with the QAnon conspiracy theories. We'll lose ground after if Trump is trounced in this election, which, oh, I hope it happens. But keep working, keep donating, keep doing whatever you can to help your favorite candidates in local races and up and down the ballot, because it's not just Donald Trump running, uh, obviously. All right. And finally, speaking of people who are still alive, Rush Limbaugh went on his show and started talking about giving an update on his illness, which apparently is terminal. And he also talked about his relationship with the Lord and that it brings him comfort. And I don't know. I wanted to play this because it's Rush Limbaugh and his performance, his long pauses, his bullshit. Does anybody that listens to this really think that he is a religious guy that actually gets up and pray? I know you're not supposed to question someone's faith if they say they're faithful. and that they. But I just, you know, when someone's making millions of dollars like this. I think they'll say just about anything. But here's Rush Limbaugh in a very honest, poignant moment about his health. More and more blessed hearing from you, knowing that you're out there praying and everything else you're doing. That is a blessing. It's just a series of blessings. And I am grateful to be able to come here to the studio, tell you about it, and really maintain as much normalcy as I can. Dramatic pause. One, two, three, four. Five, six. I know a lot of you out there going through your own challenges, whether it's cancer or another medical illness or some other life challenge, maybe even in the hospital right now. Someone told me, I think um, I think this is good advice, maybe helpful. The only thing that any of us are certain of is right now, today. Oh, all right. I like that. It's good. That's why I thank God every morning. When I wake up, I thank God that I did. I, I try bet you to don't. make it the best day I can, no matter what. Don't look too far ahead. I certainly don't look too far back. That's good, because you're a dick. I, uh, I try to remain as committed to the idea what's supposed to happen will happen when it's meant to. Well, that's a great philosophy. It's brilliant. I mentioned at the outset of this, I think the first day I told you that I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It is complete bullshit of uh, immense value, strength, confidence. I bet it's not. I bet it's not. And that's why I'm able to remain fully committed. Well, I hope you're right. 
but to the idea that what is supposed to happen will happen when it's meant to. You weren't supposed to happen. There's some comfort in knowing that, that some things are not in our hands. Your whole career is a fluke. It's a lot of fear associated with that, too. But there is some comfort. Ah, oh, you're a professional liar. It's helpful. God, is it It's helpful to be able to trust and to believe in your money in a, in a higher plan. I'll give you a higher plan. The higher plan is that you're going to quit uh, or die and uh, Trump is going to take over your time slot when he loses broadcasting from Moscow where he can't be extradited. All right. That's all I've got for you in audio and run up to the show. And now it's time to share my conversation with my good friend, Dr. Jason Johnson. He is a professor of global journalism and communication at Morgan State University, a contributor at MSNBC, the GRIO, Sirius XM, and here on Stand Up, drjasonjohnson.com, at Dr. Jason Johnson. Here we go. I'm talking to Ted Kaczynski. I have a lot of questions about clearly Ted Kaczynski. Oh, (laughs) I I was so not self-aware. I was like, wait, you've contacted your he's in prison. You're doing a piece. You've contacted the Unabomber and you're doing a piece. Oh, no, you're talking about me. Yes, yes, yes. (laughs) And the cabin and the lights. And the like, copy of the Turner Diary somewhere. It just seems like a whole, a whole oh, thing. Hold on a on. second. As I'm, <laughs> you know, actually, actually, now that you mention it, Jason, I have What's this? Here. Nope, that's a thing of weed. Um, Signed by Richard Spencer himself. Hey. <laughs> He has a lot of good qualities. Yeah, he's exactly. got a, uh, he's a handsome boy, that Richard Gosh, Spencer. The train's running on time. I have, I have a congratulations for you, Pete. I, I saw your tweet today. Oh, you're like a top fancy podcast and everything. Look at you. Th- yeah, I'm recording, so I'm glad that you gave it. Sh- so I tweeted last night. I, I found this out last night because I've I- I'm loath to look at stats. Like at SiriusXM, we didn't have ratings. I don't like any numbers on anything that measures my popularity or my success in any way because I feel like it affects my work a lot. It misleads me. It makes me think, oh, I should go over here. I should go over there. I should do that. Uh, or this. And so it's been a year and there's a couple of organizations that wanted to talk about sponsorship, like nonprofits, which I want to do because I really don't want to sell underwear. And this one uh, sponsor like did an audit and she's like, your pot media people don't always wear them during Zoom meetings. But keep going. <laughs> oh, well, that's why you're here tonight to just explore <laughs> exactly. what it must be like. Hold on. So just the, the point is, yeah, it's apparently it's in the top 10 percent of podcasts. So that means like it's in the top million podcast but what i wrote is it's a top 10 podcast and i tweeted that out and a lot of people shared it and i felt i was very like embarrassed by it but but my joke uh, of course about my embarrassment of not putting percent in there was at least i didn't get caught whacking off in front of like the most respected journalists (laughs) in the country at (laughs) least i'm having a better night than than him or my friend craig craig spencer who's a you know a uh uh, doctor who lost a kid last night. Like I was feeling bad for myself because I, I, you know, I was like, oh, I, I, I just misled by accident. But meanwhile, real people, real problems, and I felt wow. better. Yeah, wow. perspective, perspective, always. I didn't get caught whacking off in front of the most respected journalist. Well, let can we just talk only about that for the entire time I've got you? Uh, look, I, you know, and, and I, I always, I always preface with with this. I don't know the person in question. I don't know. Them. I do. Yeah, I've never met them, so I have no personal thing one way or another. I don't work with that particular, but but I, I I will say this one without revealing the name. I know people who were on that call who gave me a play by play. So when I heard what actually happened, I was like, "Oh my gosh, wow, okay, like that's what happened." Um, so that's one thing, and and the second thing is like, you know. Here, here's the thing about that, and this is always where my mind tends to go in these situations. We're all on Zoom all the time now, right? We're all on Zoom. We're all dealing with these circumstances, whatever. I feel like if you make a mistake, you know, then there should be grace. But nine times out of ten, if you have a track record of behavior, that's when you tend to get in trouble for something yeah. that 
everybody else thinks is just a one time. Anthony mistake. Weiner, Bill Clinton, Trump. Yeah. Cosby, you know. Weinstein. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's that's my that's my nice professional way of saying, <laughs> you know, there there are some people I will tell you this. There are some people that you and I know in common. Yes. Who told me a whole lot of stuff yes. about this yesterday that I'm just like, Jesus. I'm I know all those things and I've known those things about Jeffrey Tubin for a long time, but they're just things that I've heard and I'm not going to yeah. say them into a microphone. Exactly. Uh, but I worked at CNN for a while and I, you know, I traveled with him and stayed in hotels and stuff. I didn't I didn't see any, anything behavior, overt behavior. But, you know, I mean, if you stayed in a hotel room with him and he didn't try and grab you, clearly, Pete, we you weren't, you know, it, it was you weren't sexy enough the whole night. Just Supreme Court, this Supreme Court, that it was all on message. I was like, guy seems fine to me. <laughs> Granted, I look like Ted Kaczynski. Did you try that? Did you try that? Well, <laughs> it's, but by the way, it's this, it's this idea. Bear with me on this. Cause you'll take this ball and run with it. It's this idea that when a guy says, you know, I, I, this story happened, I'll just make this a public. I don't care. He doesn't probably care. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think I've ever said this into a microphone, but last April I went to Dick Cavett's house and Christopher Walken was there for a wow, small okay. gathering of people. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of stories about walking, which I will share at some point. It's fine. It's harmless. But he said mm-hmm. to me, basically he said, Jason, you know, I didn't ever see Harvey <laughs> Weinstein do anything uh, that was so bad. I didn't I didn't didn't do anything to me. And I hit Christopher Walken right between the eyes with that's because you're not an attractive young woman. Yeah, that's it. And so the yeah. point is, if a Jeffrey Tubin or if somebody you think is a creep you don't get to say if you're a guy, particularly what? Well, I never saw anything. Yeah. Well, well, I never saw. Same anything. thing for race or. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's like it's it's not just positive. Right. It, it doesn't right. mean it, it does not in any shape or form mean this didn't happen. It's like, you know, I, I'm not only have I, I, you know, every man in the world who has. Uh, women that are friends or colleagues or whatever it is, if you have good enough you've heard stories of sexual harassment, right? And you just have to sort of operate from a space of like, well, yeah, that crap probably happened because it's not going to happen to you. It's not going to happen around you. You know, I mean, I, I will tell you this. It, it's interesting, you know, because I was talking to a good friend of mine about this last night and she was like, well, you know, the problem, you know, we were talking about, the, you know, this, this situation. She's like, the problem is that, you know, guys like you, you know, you, you got to stand up more. You got to, you know, attack these guys and blah, blah, blah. I said, well, look, I get that. I said, look, that's not an issue, right? I've called out other men. I'm like, yo, dude, I don't want to have any part of this. I don't want to. That's fine. I said, but I can't be there with a cape when my friend tells me a story about a, a, a prominent journalist who had one of her friends up against the wall. And then when she encountered them, he was like, oh, I'm sorry. I thought I thought that was, that's what this interview was about. I didn't know you really wanted to interview. Like you hear stuff like that all the time. I wouldn't have seen it. I wouldn't have heard about it. But you can't say it's not true. Well, and, and, and I want to add something to this because this was a situation where you like you, know, you call things out. So when I started one of my first jobs um, as an academic. And I'm going to say this because I don't work at this institution anymore. I don't know if this individual works at the institution anymore. But I was at St. Augustine's College. That's one of the first places that I worked. I was in graduate school and I was teaching classes there. And I had several faculty members. I was new. I was still working on my doctorate. It was just there and it was a job. And I had two male faculty members come up to me. They're like, oh, hey, you're new here. My name is blank. My name is blank. It's like, hi, blah, blah. And they're like, hey, so... um, you know, what are you doing this weekend? Want to come hang out? You know, get to know us, whatever. I was like, you know, I, I said, I'm open, free. What do you guys want to do? And the guy's like, well, there's a strip club north of the city that we like going to. Now, starting off, I don't like strip clubs. It's not my thing. It's not my ministry. I don't find it appealing. But his selling point, when I was like, eh, I don't know. His selling point was like, yo, a lot of the students work there. That was his selling point. No. This is a faculty member. His selling point to me, first week on the job is, hey, come to a strip club where you <laughs> might see one of your students stripping. Needless to say, <laughs> I was like, not interested, don't want to do this at all. 
don't even really want to talk to you ever again. I'm going to sit as far away from you in faculty meetings, et cetera, et cetera. But, but I say all that to say, as offensive and problematic as that was for me, I can't imagine how the hell this was for any woman who had to work with him. Right. And eventually he got in trouble for harassing and molesting and taking advantage of students and, and fellow employees. So, you know, you, you, sometimes you see it, but you don't see how far it's going to go because you're a guy. I think that's really well said. And I think it's best illustrated in a situation like the one you just gave. I mean, we could, we could go back and forth with these stories all the time. I will say this. I don't think I've ever really said this or talked about it, but I I went to a lot of strip clubs in my (laughs) twenties. 20 to probably 30 mm. uh, uh, age. I went to strip clubs with bachelor parties. I was 20 to 30 a weekend. And I was like, that's a lot of driving and a lot of ATM visits. I <laughs> was at the time a taxi driver driving strippers around. Uh, that was just me making an honest living, protecting these ladies. No, nothing. Exactly. I, no, like t- during my, that decade of my life, I think. I probably went like bachelor parties. I remember one time we were like, we rented a cabin for my buddy for his bachelor party and hired a woman to come there and Jesus. dance and take her clothes off in the middle of the woods. She did, however, come with a security detail yeah. that looked like Andre the Giant ate Big John Stud. He was 15 feet tall. Was was he literally shaking the cabin? Was was he shaking the cabin? Uh, I ended up having to fight him. It's a long story. I beat him up. No. <laughs> and he was saying uncle. And you were like, say me uncle. And then you made him strip. And he paid you. And then you sent him. You were at that part. That's where we met. I wasn't going to peel the curtain back that far. But it was exactly. so weird. Like, I was like, everybody, that's how we get to know each other. We made like, some promises that weekend. That Jason? We talked about. Professor Johnson? <laughs> what are you? That's where I saw Pete beat a stripper. A male stripper. Thank you. Yeah. A male stripper slash bodyguard. Yeah, that's <laughs> I, I I went though, I did. And there was a comedy club that was that was a, a part strip club, part comedy club to make it legitimate to get around Giuliani's uh, law in the uh maybe two thousand, yeah, two thousand and two. Mm-hmm. And um yeah, I, I spent a lot of time at them and then I went on a journey. After that, you know, and that's what I think is what some people call woke. But I think just your own personal evolution in this case, for me, I'll say as a as a white straight man, Mm -hmm. everybody has their story to tell. And I think that's all we're asking of people is to open your mind to other people's stories and and give give a listen. Give there's a listen. Well, and give and give some freaking validation, because here's the thing, quite, quite frankly, and it's, you know, a, a, a reveal for me. Right. The reason I don't like strip clubs and, and I don't I don't think this is like some wokish thing, because I clearly have no problem with it from a commerce perspective. Hey, sex work, do whatever the hell it is you want. It should be legal, pay taxes, blah, 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 protecting the whole thing for me, purely on the straight black guy level. It was like, you don't like me. You are not remotely interested in me. Oh. So I'm paying you to pretend that you like me. Who's the sucker? Like that doesn't, that doesn't appeal to me on any level. And I'll tell you as it, the number of times that I went and I, w- I would go when I lived in Atlanta, I had a couple of friends who were like, Oh, let's go to strip club, let's go to yeah. strip club, whatever. And, 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 and this is not a humble brag. I'm just telling you this, but every time I would go to a strip club, I would not be interested. I didn't want to pay any money. And I would end up just sitting and having some conversation with some stripper and we would chat, you know, she would go and do her job, do a lap dance and come over and chat with me or whatever it is. That's pretty much how it worked. I got a couple phone numbers that way, but it was because I was not like, you know, during the restoration period, Sapphire, (laughs) Sapphire, was it anyway? That's you. I mean, yeah, yes, there, there was there was that there was, the, you know, and the, the funny thing is like the, the faux woke lame guy is always the one who's like, but she's in nursing school. I don't give a crap if somebody's in nursing school. It's a job. Right? It's a job. You, yeah. you know, I, I, I knew people who who strip for a living to pay for school. I know some people who just did it because it was fun, but it doesn't appeal to me. Paying you to pretend that you like me. That just seems sucker. I thought me. that's a really, geez, it's a fascinating thing to hear. <laughs> and sad thing a little bit to think that you're going to go there and you don't think that these women like you because you're saying, cause you're a black guy or because you're, you just didn't feel good about yourself or was well, that no, a blackness thing or a, 
No, no, it wasn't. It wasn't because I, I the only strip clubs I would know of that I was only being taken to were the black ones, right? I mean, it's, okay, it's, so it's just the like idea that they didn't actually like you. Yeah, Sorry, I read that. These people, yeah, you're yeah. just paying them to pretend that right. they don't like you. You, yeah. you're an idiot. They no, got me yeah. every time. <laughs> they but convinced th- you. It's like no, there wasn't a time I left. <laughs> I said to my buddy one day, we went to a strip club in Vegas. We sleep then, of course, in the same hotel bed, he and mm-hmm. I, for whatever reason. And then uh, we wake up in the morning and I, and, and, I, and he goes, what happened last night? I was like, I got to go back to that strip club because that girl has like 60 of my dollars that I gave to her. <laughs> and, and I think, I don't know. I think she actually really was into me. I think she was into awesome. me. Yeah, sure. It's, it's, you know what? It's right up there. Vince, with, they got me every you- time. Yeah, it, it's it's right up there with the, the the lady at the Borders bookstore really, really finds me interesting, you know, from the early 2000s. And, and the barista thinks I'm cute. No, they don't. <laughs> no, they don't. The barista doesn't think you're cute. The, the lady working at Borders books with a nose ring and attached, she doesn't think you're cute. She's literally just doing her job because she's there for eight hours. And if she doesn't make conversation with random people, she will murder everyone. So. Also, <laughs> also, don't confuse a smile, and I do, with that this woman finds me attractive. Some people are just friendly and smile. I mean, you remember smiles. I don't remember smiles. I don't see. Well, okay, so a, a, a slight sharing with, with the audience here, right? So when we were getting ready for this, um, I was at the house uh, helping do some renovations to someone that Pete knows that I don't think he knew that I knew. Right. And we were in mass. It was, it was at Karen's place. Yeah. And we Karen, you can say Karen Madison doesn't, I think she said it on the record that she knows you, which is, okay, I did yeah. know that she knew you. Yeah. yeah. So I wasn't so that actually, like we're neighbors. Like Karen doesn't live far from me. Right? Got it. And, and it's funny because we're both in mass, even though we know each other, we take walks, stuff like that from time to time. And it is funny to me, like the things that you forget about regular human contact because you come into people's homes and sometimes you're still wearing a mask and you only can recognize they're smiling because the way their eyes go. Like it's like all of this sort of basic interaction that's been jacked up because we're in the middle of a pandemic. Karen, you know, it's just, it's nuts. Karen's been really good to kind of keep me focused on the fact that there's a lot of people who are single and live alone. And how that is just such a, a a really different game changer in terms of just not being able to hug, not being able to regularly touch another human being. And so it's been helpful to have that perspective. I, I know you don't have a lot of time. And there, I didn't even get to any of the, the main things I wanted to ask you. You, you can run through you you know p i am i am quick on my feet we can we can uh, get to them i know all right well the main one was i've been uh, you know i kind of want to run by as i've done this you know off the record off the air with you but mm-hmm. i think it's also helpful to do kind of on the record like i want to run by an argument that i've been making by you and and have you punch holes in it or make it better or tell me why it's wrong but basically okay. this the idea of LeBron is the goat. Sorry, end of discussion. It's I just I watched a how great a guy he is video highlights the other night, like a ten minute of him just being with fans. Mm-hmm. He's a great guy. He's got yeah. a very charismatic fella. He really is a very likable guy. Um, great with fans. Great with kids. Great with disabled folks. So, I Ice Cube working with <laughs> Republicans. Um. Black Republicans, black conservatives, mm-hmm. like I'm hung up, Jason, on the idea that I don't want to talk with you about any policies that you have uh, either legitimately done for black folks or that you're promising to do. I can't talk to you about any of those policies until we talk about how you are obstructing black people's right to vote. And more specifically, we can't talk about any economic health, education, et cetera, policies, foreign policies at all. Things that directly mm-hmm. affect black folks, let's say, until you full throatedly support the restoration of the Voting Rights Act, then we'll talk. That's where right. I'm at. That's my argument about we can't have any other conversation until we have this one about restoring the Voting Rights Act. How, what is wrong with that? Is it too simple? Am I not being pragmatic? So it's, there's nothing wrong with it. It's not simplistic. It's not an issue of being pragmatic. I think it's an issue of. <laughs> Okay, so none of those. We're in a silly season, right? We're in a silly season. Here's the thing about Q, and I got a piece coming out tomorrow in the Grio uh, where I, I oh, sort of talk about this specifically. So that's you know one of the places that good. I that I write. Um, the thing is, 
this administration, because of Trump, has had an obsession with black celebrity because those are the only kind of black people that Trump or his entourage have any experience with. Right. Remember, the guy has no government experience and his business is all his sort of personal fiefdom and hiding money. So it's not like he's really even had to do business with black people. Right. The only black people he knows are from charities, celebrity events and everything else like that. And that's all he's freaking athletes. So, yeah, athletes. So there is this desire on the part of Trump and, 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 and those who work for him that let's deal with famous black people because those are the only black people that can do stuff. So that's that's the first problem with sort of Ice Cube. The secondary issue, quite frankly, is that it's a testament to, and this is something that I talk about in my piece, there's a certain strand of people, there's white folks like this, but I don't really care about that right now, I'm talking about black people, there's a certain strand of black, straight black man in America who conflates contrarianism with being an independent thinker. (laughs) And Uh, that is bolstered uh, by the fact that you're rich and you're famous. Yeah. And yeah. So you Ego. think I mean, it's, it's Kanye, right? Yeah. Kanye like Trump because, oh, if I'm contrarian, I must be doing something right. No, you're just being a dummy. Yeah. And, and, and so Cube, to go to your core issue, which is like, oh, voting rights after Ice Cube wasn't even informed enough to ask those kinds of questions. That's what I'm it's, that's what I'm that's what I'm assuming. I'm assuming yeah. you can be a super successful black artist in his case in many mm-hmm. r- realms and not know about the Supreme Court decision that gutted the Voting Rights Act, which was Dr. King and John Lewis and so many others. It, that was the uh, achievement, the crown r- royals on the civil rights movement, and they the- gutted it. And then Democrats voted to restore it and Republicans won't even vote on it, period. That's the story but- you need to know. Everybody. Right. That. Wait, I I lost you for a second. I don't know what happened, but. Oh, yeah. I saw you freeze up for a second. Uh, I just thought I was done with my rant. Did you hear the end of my rant? I don't know. It was a whole bunch of racial slurs. I was really. (laughs) I bet you thought you missed that part. Didn't you? Oh, I thought it cut out. (laughs) Kramer. It was just, it's just a slew of just slurs. I was so offended. I just, I articulated the chronological order of the gu- of the Voting Rights Act and how important it was, the civil rights movement, and how it was gutted by the Supreme Court, and how Congress can restore it with a vote legislatively, and they don't. Yeah. The Republicans don't, and so. But but here's the thing: you have to understand a guy like Cube and and all the other sort of Ice Cube like people out there. There's a couple of values that define them, right? And, this, and if you if you understand these values collectively, Ice Cube and Jim Brown and 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 Fifty Cent, all of these guys make sense, right? It is, and it's it's again something specific to straight black men. This is what, what I write about. Number one, it's a belief that all white people are racist and can't be trusted, right? Number two that the only way that you prove that you're a man is by making a lot of money. And the more money that you have, the more powerful you'll be. Number three, you can't really trust women uh, unless you have a lot of money and then maybe you can buy their loyalty. Number four, collective action doesn't do anything for black people, right? Marching doesn't do anything. Protests don't do anything. Voting doesn't do anything because nothing really changes. And then last, you know, uh, you're a, you're a put upon guy because you're straight and black and successful, right? A lot of black men probably subscribe to one or two of those beliefs in various ways. But when you have all five, and I know there's a sliver of guys who believe all five of those things, that's how you get people like Ice Cube. See, Ice Cube, and you hear him say this, and 50 Cent just said it in a tweet. Ice Cube is basically like, yeah, yeah, Trump is racist, but, you know, I don't really care because I'm rich. Right. Trump is gangster. Trump is cool. And, and if I had money like Donald Trump had money, if black people have money like Donald Trump had money, they would be treated better. Ice Cube literally said that in his interview with Chris Cuomo. Now, it's garbage. It's crap. Mm. But there's a strand of men who believe that 50 Cent just put out this tweet trolling people because that's what 50 Cent does. You know, oh, my gosh, the tax rate in New York is so terrible. I don't care that Donald Trump doesn't like black people. I'm voting for Trump because I want lower taxes because these men. He wrote that tweet. Yeah, yeah. 50 Cent tweeted that earlier today. It was around around 11 o'clock this morning. Oh, boy. But 50 Cent is a troll. 
and he has been seeing all the attention that's been paid to Ice Cube for a couple of days, and he wants to get in on the action. My point in all this is that these guys do not represent a large number of black people, and they have a level of sort of ignorance mixed with a nihilism about politics that allows them to have these attitudes. Nothing is going to change for Ice Cube, whether Trump or Biden get elected. So ultimately, he can say whatever dumb crap he wants because he's going to be fine. He can sit there and say, we need to do something about reparations, and the Congressional Black Caucus hasn't done anything, even though Karen Bass, who's the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, is a Los Angeles congresswoman who he could call at any point. Ice Cube didn't even know that. Ice Cube was, I can, I can tell you this is from somebody else that we know. Ice Cube was invited to a sit down. Him, along with Snoop and Dre and Luda, a lot, they were invited to a sit down with Senator Kamala Harris as the vice presidential pick. Cube didn't even show up. But then he's going to turn around and say the Biden campaign didn't want to listen to him. It's nonsense, man. It's uh, all nonsense. Something's wrong with my audio, but is it okay? Can you hear me? I, I can hear you. That, that is a fascinating, I just want to be clear with what you did so nobody misconstrues it or generalizes it too much. You gave me, us, basically a, a, a strain, a psychological profile of a specific yes. type of straight black male thinking. Yep. Um, and we, I don't know, we're not giving a, a percentage of how many straight black males think that, but it's really interesting to understand where all that comes from. That's where my first questions would be. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what people should try to try to understand. Why do people think the way they think? But you uh, giving us that kind of archetype is a really interesting, I think, and an important way to try to understand. But I don't, you know, people obviously should be careful about generalizing about straight black men and what they think. But well, it, it, you don't want to generalize, but, you know, it's not that hard to figure out where all those values and beliefs come from, because, quite frankly, there's a low hanging fruit. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, if, if you consider sort of the patriarchy in America and capitalism, that's how it works. A lot of what makes Donald Trump attractive to a small but loud. This is the thing. A small but loud number of black men is Donald Trump lives the kind of life. Remember, this guy, people would shout him out in rap songs and stuff like that in the 80s and the 90s. Mm. Donald Trump lives the kind of life and has a kind of masculinity that very few black men ever get to experience. Black guys don't get to run around and just be assholes the way some white men get to. And, And that's attractive to them. And so if America tells you the way to be a man is make a ton of money and then you can treat women however you want, you can treat, you can, you can, you can tell the government to kiss your butt. You can do whatever it is that appeals to people who have never been able to experience that kind of masculinity, because you've been told that's the only way you can be a man anyway. That's where it comes from. Now, do I think I I can tell you this, if you want to talk about percentages, that ain't the majority of black dudes. That ain't even like a minority of black dudes, but I can tell you this. Of the 13 percent of black men who voted for Donald Trump in 2016, 100 mm. percent of those guys. <laughs> that, that I can tell you, 100 yeah. percent of the black men who vote for Trump think that way. Now, there's guys who think that way who didn't vote for Trump, but everybody who did thinks that way. Can you tell me about your white friend who is voting for Trump that you tweeted about? Sure. Yeah, I, this is a good route. Yeah. So I'll tell you the story. I tweeted about this uh, earlier today. So I have. I have often mocked uh, my black friends who have these 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 deep, painful stories about how they've lost white friendships and unfriended people from high school, whatever it is, um, you know, because of their beliefs. And I I will say this. I have. I don't have problematic white friends or colleagues. I don't. And, and, and we don't talk every day, but I'll tell you, I actually consider Pete to be a friend. I've known Pete for a long time. He's a good guy. And we have conversations that aren't always about work. So I, I, I consider actually consider Pete to be a friend. I don't have a lot of problematic white people in my life. So I don't have these problems. <laughs> I don't have these issues of right. hearing some white person who I've known for 20 years say, oh, my gosh, you know, Trump is so good. And then I have to deal with it. So what happened is I, I have a friend who I've known since college. and. Every year, uh, we would see each other once or twice a year because a bunch of us will all go down to Dragon Con, which is this big comic book convention in Atlanta. We talk about Star Wars, Star Trek, blah, blah, blah. 
2016, he voted for Trump. Now, he's a Republican. I've known he's a Republican. He's from Virginia, almost heading out to West Virginia. And when he did, um, I was like, dude, like, Trump is a racist. He's terrible. And my boy was like, we're going to call him Bob. And Bob was like, oh, Jason, it's not going to be so bad. And he actually sent me a Black Panther. uh, (laughs) It's not going to be so bad. Yeah, kitchen magnet. And told me, like, it'll be okay. I'm like, what? 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 Right. Like, that's what made me feel better. He thought you a superhero He's magnet, a black, black superhero, superhero magnet, magnet. <laughs> and said it'll be okay. So it'll be okay. If you I'm get like, right. if you get nervous about the white supremacy and and, the, and all the horror, horror, you can take the this magnet down and look at it. Yes. And think of me in West Virginia. And pretend like, okay. you're Black Panther and you're going to stop it all. So in subsequent years, right, we're cool. We still go to car events or whatever, tweet back and forth. But uh, a week or two ago, we're on this text chain. And we're actually talking about like Star Trek Discovery. And he sends this like cartoon where it's like, you know, it's Republic. It's a Democrat saying, hey, should our new slogan be hiding with Biden? It was like Joe Biden hiding under a staircase because <laughs> that's a whole Republican thing. Yeah, Where's Joe Biden? Right. I don't know. Maybe avoiding COVID instead of licking frogs and having kissing booths like Trump does. Hey, anyway, <laughs> so 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 anyway, so he sends this and I text him. I was like, dude are you actually going to vote for Trump again? And he's like, well, Jason, he's like, that's a simple question with a really complicated answer. Yeah. I was like, dude, not really. And he's like, well, so he goes to this whole thing about how he doesn't like Trump and he doesn't like Joe Biden's too far to the left. And, and this is something I couldn't put in the tweets because it's more detailed. And I was like, dude, you know what it's like to live under Joe Biden. If you, you're, my, my friend is technically all assets because of where he lives in the land. He's a lawyer or whatever. He's technically a millionaire, right? Uh, and I was like, you made, you became a millionaire or at least one millionaire under the Obama administration. Yeah. You don't know what the hell Joe Biden yeah. is like. You can't claim that you're worried about him being some crazy leftist who's going to take your guns, right? And in the end, and I said, and what about like money. the white nationalism and Trump that people's hired? And in the end, he basically just gaslighted me. He's like, well, I don't know if Trump is racist. Uh, and I don't know if the Obama era was really that good. And I was like, dude, okay. And that's what ended our relationship for me. Because I don't care that you vote for Trump. I don't care that you're a Republican. What I care about is don't insult my intelligence and don't gaslight me. That's the only thing that matters. Do you think, did you, did you end the friendship in any kind of official way, or you, you just spread them off? That's it. You, you, I'm ghosting that dude. We're done. Because we my, my cool the reason no I, I, you're not cool anymore. Yeah, we're you're not sick. cool anymore. So, so but, what does that mean in a practical sense? I mean, ain't no comic good conventions to go to, well, so I'm not going <laughs> to see him. No, but right? my, my the reason why I ask that is because I wonder if he cares about your friendship and about you, and clearly you're upset and don't even want to be friends with them anymore. And that's your right. And I think, I, I mean, I obviously I understand that fully, but does he change at all? Does his opinion now, when you go as far as saying, you know what, we're, we're good. Good luck. We're done. Yeah. Does he, so, is he affected in a way that says, you know what, maybe I should rethink my position on Trump because I really like Jason. I respect Jason. This is kind of what he does for a living, which is, you know, <laughs> yeah. It's, so, so I look at this two ways and I, it's funny. One of my friends was like, he's like, do you have a conversation? I said, no, I said, look, we don't live near each other. And I said, and, and he is from, we've known each other for 20 years. When I say I'm good, that doesn't mean that I will ignore you or ghost you, but it means I'm good. You're not going to get the same kind of responses from me. I'm not going to engage you in the same way. And I don't trust you in the same kind of way. And some of that requires a formal announcement. If there was some expectation, if if we got on the phone every Thursday and did fantasy football, I would say, by the way, I'm not doing that anymore because F you. Um, and in some instances, it's very easy for me to say, nah, we're not cool. And I told him that in the text. I was like, yeah, this has been very enlightening. We're good. And, and he's like, I love you, brother. I was like, no, see, <laughs> let's be clear. Well, this is a little upset. This is a little upsetting for me to hear this because I just I'm I'm now I'm I'm going back in our text message conversation and I just <laughs> this is I'll just read it. I'll read both sides. It says any chance, Jason, you can talk around six or any time later. And then you write, I'm good. Yeah, yeah. And then I'm I write so I'm done. <laughs> How about seven? I'm good. 
Anytime <laughs> around eight, I'm good. Then you send me a picture of you and Karen Madison. I was like, oh, that's awesome. Can you talk later? I'm good. Uh, okay, so I guess. <laughs> you didn't pick up the hint, Pete. I was trying to tell you. Well, I got it. You clearly didn't understand. That's how I break up friendships with white people. I got <laughs> well, it. Breaking up friendships with white people is something I, I think I just did because I'm on a text message with 18 guys I went to high school with in, mm. in, in bumfuck upstate New York. And I said in a text message to them, if any of you are voting for Trump, I just want you to know, I know we never talk about politics here, but we aren't friends anymore. Mm -hmm. And it got real ugly. I can imagine. And I got really ugly. And I ended up like apologizing for some of the things I said, Mm -hmm. but then had long conversations with three of these guys where I basically explained to them, you, you're you doing well. You're good. I'm, I'm not. My friends aren't. And, I tr- mm-hmm. and it, was, it resonated. My, my point is telling you this story is I think it is really effective when white men do this to other white men. Exactly. Exactly. Because, look, if you can't They really see- were interested in what I had to say. How could, Pete, you think that we grew up in the same community, went to the same high school? How are we on such different pages? I feel like, and, and, and this is a, a difference, like I said, me and, 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 and my old bud, um, you know, we grew up in as, as completely different environments as possible. You know, he's from rural Virginia. I grew up all over the world, et cetera, et cetera. But I think ultimately for me, you know, it, it's, more, it's, it's more of a respect and an intelligence issue. Uh, than, than it is an ideological one, because I can accept people having ideological beliefs that I disagree with. I'm friends with atheists. I'm friends with people who have all sorts of beliefs. I'm friends with some people who are homophobic. And I'll tell them, like, you're homophobic. I, I, I know people who are anti-Semites. I know people who are anti-Black racist. I know lots of people. And, and those relationships vary in how close they are depending on the circumstances. But what you can't do is BS me about why you believe what you believe, because then I don't trust you. If you say I'm voting for Trump because he's going to keep my taxes low, then fine. But don't give me this nonsense. I was like, I don't know if Trump is racist. Dude, you just don't care that he's racist. And I'm OK with that. Yeah. But I'm not OK with you lying about that. That That's my sort of thing. If somebody who was pro-life said to me, well, you know, Barack Obama is comfortable with abortions and a million black babies being killed per year. I wouldn't respond and say, well, I don't know if Obama believes in that. I would be like, yeah, I don't really get upset by abortion. I'm not going to lie. I don't wake up every night thinking about abortions. Right. So, you know, that's, that's, that's the difference. But I do think I, I, I'm not a fan of the yelling, screaming, oh my God, I can't believe you believe what you believe kind of thing. I do this crap for a living. I don't, I don't have to change people's minds. Um, but I don't like lying and I don't like dishonesty and I don't like disingenuous belief systems. And there's some, look, and I'm different in this way. I have some other people who I know in my life who are like, I can't be friends with a Trump supporter because if you vote for Trump, it inherently means that you don't respect me as a human being, as a woman, as a black person, as a Muslim, et cetera, et cetera. But for me, it's kind of like, well, if you are, and this may be not fair for me to say, But if you are the kind of black person that doesn't think that you have white people in your life who treat you as their exceptional Negro anyway, then I'm sorry that you're just making that realization now. Because I have plenty of white people in my life where I am the one black guy they know or the one black guy they're cool with, and they probably ain't particularly cool with other black people. Mm. And we have that conversation, but I can tell I have students like that. (laughs) <laughs> you know, and it's like, now I may not be particularly close to those people, but I'm not naive enough to think that my relationship with them is some transformative experience that's going to make them more open minded. I ain't, I ain't got the time and energy for that and I'm not paid for it. <laughs> well, I think your behavior and the way that you live your life and, and, and behave towards them is is change enough. It's an effect enough. I think you're the kind of person people want you to like them. And if you don't, then they probably, I, I'll speak for myself. I would think like, oh, I wonder, I wonder what I did. I mean, I dogged you all day to get you to record this. <laughs> Pete hunted me down, everybody. Like he texted me like several, several uh, times. I, I stopped you. I was like, I'm telling him I'm good. 
You you kept saying you're good, but then I saw a tweet. You were at a store and you felt bad because a girl had a pandemic T-shirt. My first yes. pandemic, which made yes. me sad. I was like, why am I looking at Twitter? But then I knew that you were in a store. I was like, oh, he's in a store. So yes. maybe we'll be able to get him later when he gets home. I, I, I just oh. left Karen's and I'm, I'm actually uh, I'm, I'm traveling tomorrow. And so I wanted to get some fish because where I'm going, I'm not going to be able to get fish. And I saw this adorable little kid, sweet as little, so this little brown girl. And she was sitting in, in this sort of fish place. And she was, you know, I mean, keeping a two-year-old's mask on. She's playing with her mask. And she has on this blue shirt and it had this green COVID virus thing with a mask on it. And it says, my first pandemic. And it was so sad. Yeah. I was I was so, so sad just seeing that that's what this two-year-old's dealing with. So she's waving at me and smiling as two little kids do. <laughs> and so as her mom is taking her out, she's like, bye. And I said, I hope it's your last pandemic. And her mom's like, me too. And then she just walks out. And I was like, my God, like, what is that like for a two-year-old? Like, it's nuts. <laughs> well, if she's that young, she probably has no idea what it means. And parents probably shouldn't be dressing up their kids to get laughs like that. But it did make me, as a comedian, <laughs> it made me think of a bunch of my first blank jokes. And just those blanks would be horrible times and human experience. So I'm going to skip them. Um, all right, man. Yeah, my first alt-right march. Um, but anyway... <laughs> I would love that. Um, but yeah, yeah. So that, that's my thought. But anyway, so I, I will tell you this. I will tell you this for, for, for um, and I'm, I'm going to make this promise to you, Pete, because I, I, I split in my time. I'm in this whole, whole rushing around thing, but I'm going to make this promise to you. So we're going to talk at least twice before the election, because after the election, I might have to be in a bunker, but <laughs> we will make it a point. We will make it a point. I will, I will carve out time for you next week and like the week of the election. So you give me dates and times and we will make that happen because the next two weeks are going to be, I, I, there's language that I don't, I don't always want to use, but well, we're, I hope we're, it means you're in high demand talking to people about things. Dude, you're my third podcast of the day, but great. you know, it's great. <laughs> it's great. I, people like you are going to be in high demand because you're able to explain a lot of things very honestly and thoughtfully. And that's why I love talking to you. I will give you those dates later and nail you down. And I uh, so appreciate your time and your friendship. I love talking to you. Do you like camping? Um, you're the kind of guy I'd oh. want to go camping with because I could just sit and ask him questions and he would tell me things. It's funny because the way you said that reminded me of the scene in Airplane where the guy's like, you ever seen a gladiator movie? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't. That wasn't. So much like, that like wasn't on airplane. where I was going. Um, believe it or not, believe it or not, I do actually like camping, but I haven't been for years. The closest I've mm. been to camping is when I went with some friends uh, on safari to Tanzania last year. Um, wow. and that was incredible. Well, that's weird because that's where I was going to take you. Uh, but uh, we'll have to go to the Adirondacks best christmas gift ever uh we could go go to tanzania which which again when you're on the reservation unless the tigers and lions um have covid like we saw with tiger king earlier this year it might be the safest place to be so that's awesome i don't hear about that when we go camping you'll tell me about your camping trip in tanzania uh Most definitely all right man thank you so much for talking to me i really really appreciate it jason i'm looking forward to reading that article in the grill awesome. I'll, I'll link right, I'll to that to you. later Pete. later bud there you go jason johnson I was chasing that guy all day, trying to catch up with him. Great conversation. Follow him on Twitter. Tell him you heard him here. He's very generous to me. He's been a great friend to me. I, I love talking to him. I really thought that through about the idea of uh, going camping with him. Like the uh, comedian Burt Kreischer has done this uh, with a Netflix show. I haven't really watched it, but uh, it's really a funny idea to get a group of guys together, in this case guys, and do something and hang out. And I thought it would be hilarious and so I pitched on Twitter after after that conversation. I I, I selected uh, Jason Johnson, Ellie Mistal, and Wajahad Ali. I said if we all went camping and, and filmed it all, the conversations, the the hijinks, the hoots and hollers, it, it, would you watch? And everybody's like, yeah. And or I no, I asked who else would you suggest be on that show? So a lot of people were uh, contributing to that fun idea. I would do that, by the way. 
I, if we could get a budget to film it, that would be amazing. Just all these really thoughtful conversations, but also a lot of hilarity because those guys are really funny guys. That would be so much fun. All right. Now to something very different. Science, virology, mar- uh, microbiology. Bio- I can't even say the words. With Dr. Megan May. Dr. May is a professor of all these things. She is an expert. She has a PhD. She has a master's in science. And she's uh, been on the show several times before. I love speaking with her. I had a whole bunch of questions about what we've seen, what we're going to see, and why we haven't done better. We had a great conversation. And she's really funny. She's got a dark sense of humor, as apparently all people in her line of work do. And I love it. She makes me laugh real hard. She's living uh, up in Maine, right near a lighthouse. We had a lot of fun with all of that and more. Here's my conversation with Dr. May Five on Twitter, by the way. Dr. M A Y Five. Give her a follow. Tell her you heard her on Stand Up, and here it is. All right, it's been far too long since I spoke with Dr. Megan May. She's a real life doctor. She's got a degree. She's got a lot of degrees. She's got PhDs. She's got MSs. I don't even, I'm not even smart enough to know what those stand for, but they're in microbiology and infectious disease. And she is the first person who told me that this was going to be a very big thing way back in December 2019. And I listened, not quick enough, but I did because this is what you do for a living. You study infectious disease. Dr. Megan May, welcome back. Do I have that right? You do have that right. Thank you so much. It has been too long. It's delightful to see you. So you too, and we're doing this via Zoom, and she's somewhere near a lighthouse in New England. That's all I can tell you, (laughs) Um, which I think is everybody in New England uh, is the stereotype. There's there's not a big radius that's not lighthouse adjacent. Right, right. That's what our whole thing. Yeah. I mean, basically, for most of the country, New England is watered down to a magnet that somebody took a vacation there back in the 80s. It holds up. That's, <laughs> that's how it is. <laughs> so infectious disease, what, what have you generally studied throughout your career? Where does a, a virus like COVID fit in? Right. So when we, um, when we study infectious diseases, that can be actually a lot of different stuff under one big umbrella. So you can have people who look at different microbes and try to figure out how they create the diseases that they do, right? So what kind of proteins do they make that make you sneeze or puke or do whatever it is that you're doing, bleed out your eyeballs? (laughs) There are people who study that, like how do those microbes actually physically do that to you? There are people who study, well, how are they transmitted from one person to another? There are people who study how do their genetics change and when their genetics change how do the tests we use to detect them have to change Mm. and um so someone like me what i do is i study what we call emerging pathogens or these brand new diseases that appear out of nowhere and either cause a few obscure sick people some remote corner of the world or they do you know this that we're all living through. And so the way that we study this is, at least in my case, is I look a lot at at genetics, and then I look a lot at how those microbe genetics can help us predict what type of microbes might be good candidates to jump from some animal reservoir into a human and actually be able to make people sick. Is that usually how it happens, by the way? Almost always when we have humans contracting viruses from animals. Usually. Yep. Almost always. So so when you hear people talking about the, our food systems and factory farming and you know how there's obviously different standards in a wet market in China versus a factory in Philadelphia. I don't know why I picked Philadelphia. Um, That's, (laughs) are those conversations about humans and, and food consumption Are those really interesting to you because we need to do a way better job and maybe we shouldn't be eating all these factory produced animals? Am I getting anything? Is that something you think about? Um, All the time. Well, first of all, Philadelphia knows good and well what it did. I didn't know you saying that. I'm just trying to be yeah. um, I realized halfway through that, I'm like, it sounds like I'm referencing some weird conspiracy. I'm not. I'm just... you gotta, anyway. It's sad that you have to worry about that. You have to, like, cover for that. Go ahead. I know. Halfway through, I was like, oh, no. Oh, I know. <laughs> it's like it's, it's but, nuts. Um, yeah, it's the world we live in. Anyway. But anyway, um, 
Yeah, no. So when we think about things like how dense our farmed animal, our production animals are housed and how they can pass microbes and um, antibiotic resistance genes as is a real problem for um, for factory farming, how they can pass things amongst each other and then how those things can then be transmitted to either the meat processing workers, the farm workers, the vets that are taking care of them. Um, they come into, we tend to think of um, feedlot animals as just sort of being off by themselves, but they actually either when they're alive or, or afterwards when they're being processed, they come in contact to an awful with an awful lot of people and often in high density, kind of high pressure situations. I'm thinking pigs and cows and, or poultry too. Yeah, oh yeah. Poultry all too. It, poultry yeah. Are, are incredibly intensively housed. Right. Um, we, and then you hear about all those bird flus and stuff. So Exactly. So um so that's one element. Another element and so you you mentioned wet markets a second ago. Um so just the idea there and, and what makes wet markets, you know, which what makes people like me kind of queasy when we look at them is um, it's not so much that you have this intensive packing of animals the way you would on a feedlot. It's more that you have this incredible wide variety of animals and you often have them butchered on site as opposed to being taken somewhere else. Um and you also have, because these are not contained buildings, they, they tend to be like a series of stalls or, or um, just kind of open. Um, uh, what am I trying to say? I'm losing my train of thought. But um, they, they're just kind of these open um, yeah, stalls or tables or whatever else. You also can have. At the market, you mean the way that they sell, they're just, oh, yeah. Mice right, and rats, exactly. you so said? So you just have like these city animals running in and out as well. Oh. So one of the things that, that happens often with emerging diseases is, it, is that you have what's called a reservoir species. So um, some animal that some microbe lives in very happily and, and relatively peacefully. Um, so we could think of for us, we have all of these microbes that live on our skin and in our gut and everything else. And they keep us healthy and they're supposed to be there and, and we live in in quite nice harmony with them. Um, other animals have their own suite of microbes that do the same thing. And what happens is one of those, if it jumps into a human, most of the time, absolutely nothing's going to happen. But every so often, something bad can happen. They can right. make you incredibly sick. More commonly, what happens is that you have a microbe jump from a reservoir species into some other animal adapts a teeny little bit and then jumps into a human. So when you're mixing a whole bunch of different animals, many of which are wildlife and some of which are literally not even there as part of the market, but they're just like feral cats wandering by, you really are creating a, a essentially an evolutionary laboratory for any of these transmission events to happen. And then when you look at the population density in say Guangdong, China, where SARS emerged in Wuhan, where where um, SARS-CoV-2 and, and um, COVID emerged. These are incredibly densely packed areas. And so that's it's it's equally as much a problem, but it's a very different problem um, from the, the feedlot animals. And then you also have emergence of novel um novel pathogens from animals just by dumb bad luck so something like hiv is a great example of that where it it's not anything practice wise that was done that we would think of as inappropriate right so you'd have um hiv jumped into humans from uh from primates and the way that undoubtedly that that happened is that in at times and in parts of um in parts of Africa and other parts of the world too, but some primates are, are slaughtered and eaten as bushmeat because if you can catch them and if they're available, it's perfectly good eating, right? So in field butchering, um, and anybody who listens who's maybe a hunter or something like that, you can, I mean, it's like a, you know, it's like a bloodbath when you're actually field dressing an animal. Right. And 
if you have if true you of any animal primate sorry yeah that's true of any I mean, of a deer i mean i think most people would probably oh, think it's it's yeah, they, they, they uh so if you think about field dressing a deer i mean there's blood there's yeah. cutting there's chopping and so yeah. the 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 chances of getting blood to blood contact between a human and an animal is not it's not minimal. Right. And that's exactly where HIV came from. And so, which eventually spread all over the world. And that's not like anyone did anything wrong. Per- pernicious or, or that could have been. That should have been done differently. It's just. But you could, but, 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 but you could regulate these markets and, and regulate farms in America and, you know, yes. I mean, people don't want to right. be regulated, but this, these regulations are the things that protect us from having a virus that tears through our population. So the, the cost it's, of um, one outweighs the cost of other. Maybe government, we can talk about policies that would would be fair for, in this case, farmers. But well, let me ask you, I, I, you know, it's interesting. It's uh, always interesting to talk about, you know, what we know about the origins of these viruses and obviously you've established your credibility here before but in case people haven't heard megan may dr may on this show before uh she's the real thing very very smart uh expert on this stuff so you know i, I gotta i guess i just wanted to ask you kind of a broad question about what if anything you, have you snowed but anyway yeah right come on <laughs> be modest you have uh, all kinds of degrees i'm reading your bio right now it's very long um <laughs> Uh, so well, I lost interest halfway through. Was, you know, no, you were. I, I didn't know that you studied in uh, in Florida, as a matter of fact, at one point. I Do I have that right? Yes. Yeah, see, it's all here. I did. One um, of my kids is a native Floridian. So oh, I'm we, so, so sorry to hear that. Taunt him with that when he's older. So Florida badly. citizenship. To say like Florida man. Blah, when yeah. He does something goofy in high school. You can always go back. Um, so. <laughs> How, if anything, have you been surprised? I'm sure that you've been surprised. I know that you've been. I've read your Twitter feed. Disappointed, angry about the government reaction to this. Um, but has there been any real major missteps that, I mean, I know I'm sure there's several, but that you point to that that could have made a world of difference? Sometimes it's hard to prove a negative, uh, but we hear a lot about how many thousands of lives have might have been saved had you had, say, a mask mandate. Um, you're tweeting that you still think gloves actually should be worn, according to a recent some recent research. Uh, but w- w- when you look back at what we've been through so far, and then we'll talk about what we're about to see, and apparently it looks pretty grim the next six to 12 months. But w- looking backward, Megan, what do you what do you what do you want to say about a kind of autopsy about what we've seen so far from the federal reaction or any other? Well, I think that there are three big things that jump out to me. And the first is, I mean, you already mentioned it, the mass mandate. And it the best way, I the best analogy I've seen on this is there's a you know cartoon. I've seen it on different social feeds like a billion times at this point. But there's a cartoon of... Um, you know, of an apartment building during the Blitzkrieg. And, you know, what if every window had blackout curtains, except there's one jagweed at the bottom with his lights blaring on yelling, it's my right to have my lights on. And then everybody gets, you know, gets blown up. It like, I I can't think of a better analogy than that. Um, It's, it's really absurd in that if we had a national mandate or even if we didn't have a national mandate, if we could just have national leadership. And that means role, role modeling, wearing a mask, wearing not disparaging those. Um, because yeah. there are plenty of states that have them. And there are um, even if not states, there are municipalities that have them. Um, you know, we're both in the Northeast. And so, I mean, it's incredibly rare to be out, at least for me, and not see everybody in a mask. And, you know, talking to friends and and colleagues in the South, it's exactly the opposite. Everybody, you know, who perhaps not now after their big surge, but, um, you know, in in April or May when, you know, people were just essentially just making fun of this so much, um, the the two or three people out that had a mask on would be like kind of looked at funny. And here it's exactly the opposite. But. So, that's, so if we had even a, a mandate would have been great, but even just modeling the behavior and reinforcing how important it is. And um, I, I think that would have just 
gone leaps and bounds toward toward effectively stemming this. So that's that's, that's number one. one. Yeah. Um, second is the Defense Production Act was it was used eventually on a few things. It should have been used much earlier and much more widely. Um, it, there, there were several, um, there were several conversations, particularly uh, within states in the Northeast and the Mid Atlantic, where you actually had states making packs to to leverage buying power as groups, as a as opposed to competing with each other. Very for weird resources. That's a really good point. Um, the 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 idea that states were left to price compete against each other is unbelievable to me. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful to have lived in a state with a governor who worked cooperatively with her neighboring governors, um, it, whether, you know, regardless of which party they were in, because, you know, the governor of Maryland is a Republican, the governor of Massachusetts is, is a Republican. They all worked together and they, they were able to leverage buying power that way. Right. And that, why that did not happen on a national level is just inexcusable. I, I, I cannot understand why that would not happen. Well, actually, I do understand. And I think the answer to it was in Bob Woodward's tapes, right? Um, it was political, we, right? right? I mean, we it was, wanted to pretend this wasn't happening. Yeah. Um, but that's, you know, that's um, not what adults uh, are supposed to do, unfortunately. Um, so that's two. Yeah. The competition between states for resources, yeah. ventilators and everything else. What's three? And, and the idea that the, the Defense Production Act eventually right. was Defense used Production for ventilators, Act. but it, it should have been done well before Wouldn't that. Wouldn't have been controversial at all. Would have been leadership. No, yep. not at all. It would yep. not have been controversial at all. Um, and then the the third is that um, we had this messaging coming from national leadership that almost presented a, a dichotomous choice between the economy and controlling the virus. Right. In that I think so many people have, have said, you know, on on the kind of punditry circuits, and they're absolutely right, is that those things are not mutually exclusive. It's not a binary choice. And the best way to help the economy is to control the virus. And so we're now still even, um, you know, even on silly local community message boards, you know, I still every so often touch the hot stove and find myself <laughs> arguing with people who are saying it's been long enough. We need to reopen the economy. And you want to say, how many times, how long do you have to sit here and watch this? Smolder? I kind of want you to have me as an outlet. Like, I want you to text me anytime you touch the hot stove. Like, I, I did it. I did it again. I need it. I, need, I don't know why. I don't know what I was thinking when I jumped in this Facebook thread. Well, yeah, I, th I think that that final point is a really, really important point as well, because I, I, the economy versus public health thing, it really does seem like. If you're going to be responsible, some people might use the word conservative fiscally. The idea is to spend as much money as you can on something like testing. And Absolutely. and you will and you see this at universities and other pro and, and companies they're doing. They're testing everybody multiple times. It costs a lot of money. These tests are expensive, but you're able to function. You're able to operate. You're able to make money. And of course, it's not exactly. going to be the case for restaurants and bars and comedy clubs and, and, and music venues because of the nature of that. You're not, not every business is going to be able to operate, but you do see a lot of campuses and organizations in entire states spending a lot of money so that they can not have to shut down so that they can operate. And that is what you mean by not being mutually exclusive, I think. And Absolutely. For example, my, um, there's, there's, a thousand examples I'd love to throw in, but just a small scale expenditure. Um, so my my kids school district spent the money, created a position to hire our own contact tracer. Yeah, for the great, great, and great idea. We had three weeks into school. There was one case at one school, which, of course, happened to be one of my kids schools. So <laughs> they close it for two days. 
contract tracer goes around. They put him right. They put that kid right in the lighthouse. He has to stay there for two weeks. <laughs> you isolate him in the lighthouse. He has to like put the thing on, and then he has to operate the crash. That's on him. And he came know, out he with a weird, a long life. beard and a corn cob pipe, but whatever. He's healthy. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of weird stories. <laughs> and if it weren't for those meddling kids, we would have gotten away with it. Sorry, Scooby Doo references. Uh, so, so the, yeah, that you spend money he was on wearing a mask of somebody else's face. It was bizarre. Um, but... Wow, that um, is crazy up there in New England. It is, but um, but yeah, you're, event, we're, we're talking about so they, what's another example? Up, the tracer and spending money right, on the tracer. So yep. they, they hire a contact tracer. They wind up with. Um, you know, they identify two more kids. They closed that one school for two weeks instead of the whole district because they were able to see right away if there's no siblings that are going to be exposed to another school. Like it was an expenditure, but it kept the district operating. And it, it's exact. It's like you have to make these investments and nobody wants to make these investments. But frankly, this is the situation we find ourselves in. And so we have to deal with it accordingly. Um and, and there's one more uh, just small point I think is worth mentioning. Um, during the f- one of the rounds of stimulus negotiations, I believe it was Steve Mnuchin who said this, but I'm like 80 percent sure. So if it was somebody else, I apologize. Was it um, uh, somebody but- kill me? Was it that? Is that what he said? Because he's got a tough. <laughs> I don't feel oh, bad for him. I don't feel bad for him. Don't get me wrong. But Oh, dude made his bed, but still <laughs> yeah. unenviable position. I'm sorry. Um, what, what did but- he say? Um, no, he, he he said, well, what would you want us to do? Pay people to stay home and not go to work? Yes, that is exactly what you should be doing right now. <laughs> because people need to eat, people need to buy things, and people need to not congregate right now. It's so, weird when they bring their strange uh, conservative economic dogma and philosophies to the table ever because they don't work, much less now. <laughs> Uh, and a situation like this is not it's it's not applicable, well, it's, buddy. It's, it's it's trying to apply normal parameters to a very abnormal situation. Well, if I were going to be like like the total capitalist argument is like, yeah, because the opposite is if you don't, then then you kill all of your customers. <laughs> you don't right, have anybody. It's every. As though there's Ayn Rand and Karl Marx and nobody in between. Yeah. And I mean, like is, like movie so. theaters, like no one's coming to your movie theater anymore because you didn't pay them to stay home. That's the point. That's the that's the deal. All right, let me move on to just uh, so those are uh, several things that could have been done differently. Let's talk about now the future, Megan. Um, I'm hearing all these experts talk about like the next six to twelve months. We're headed into a very dark period, and I'm hearing this from more than a couple people. Um, what, what are what are they talking about, and do you think they're right? I do think they're right. Unfortunately, for 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 two reasons, and the first is. Can I be a total nerd and share my screen because this is Zoom and I can do that? Um, I think so. It's my Zoom. Do I have to give you permission? You you do. You disabled screen sharing. Uh, Because I know (laughs) what goes on on your separate screen. It's it's nothing but filth. All you academics. Tubin ruined it for the rest of us, man. (laughs) Tubin. Tubin! Yeah, Tubin. (laughs) Where is the thing that allows me... It's okay. It, it's not a big deal. It's just a really cool visual on on the seven day moving average. So essentially, I'm gonna, I'll try to draw this with my hands to to make it quasi reasonable. But starting in March, we had cases, and then we had cases like that. Right, went way up very fast. Mm-hmm. And then there was the discussion of flatten the curve, and we kind of did this. So what most of the rest of the world did was this, and then this. We just did this. And then we started reopening things. People reopened bars and restaurants to full capacity in some states. And then we did this. So that was the second spike people were talking about. And then in at the end of July, we got to a, a, a peak. That was the Sunbelt cluster. And then we started to do this. And then we kind of leveled off. And now we're doing this again. So the 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 current um, seven day moving average looks exactly like this, and so even if at this moment we could like freeze time and not have any further transmission, which again is not realistic, but even if we did that, that curve is still going to do this for a little bit because you have people who are going up, getting and incubating, and they haven't been diagnosed yet, right? Right. 
Um, and then hospitalizations are going to lag a little bit behind that because people have to get sick enough to be in the hospital after they've been diagnosed. So, um, so that curve being shaped like that, even if you just froze everything, it's still going to be straight up for the next few weeks. That being said, clearly we aren't freezing everything and people are, um, so I, Michael Osterholm was, was talking about this um, and, I, and he's, I think, had the quote about the dark days ahead um, and, and he's absolutely right. But he made the point, and um, Peter Hotez has made it on several outlets too. I know you guys are are, are friendly. Yep. Um, yep. Just that people are just exhausted with this, yep. and yep. so it's so tempting to just Punch pretend out. it's not a problem anymore, right? Because you, there's this temptation to think, well, this should be over by now. You guys said it would be over by right. now, right? And so, well, we said it would be over by now if you like did the things we were supposed to do which we didn't. So it's not, um, that's an important so point. Yes. It's so it, not only can we not freeze things, I, I th there's no reason to expect that that's going to do anything, but continue straight up because we not are, we are not changing our behavior in response to that. And we really need to be, um, so that's one reason why I, I think it's going to be pretty rough. Um, and then the other is that it's, it's almost flu season. And um, we have no idea what a, a COVID and flu co-infected patient is going to look like. Are, are they going to be more contagious? Are they going to be sicker? Are they going to die faster? Like what? Are they actually going to be less of a problem because they can't get off their couch because they're so sick, so they're not going to transmit to anybody? Um, I mean, are they? There are many ways that I could envision that going, but we just don't know what's going to happen yet. What they did see in Australia, because they just they're just finishing their flu season. Oh right, right now, yeah, um, yeah. They saw that they had far fewer flu cases because everyone was masked and distant and and staying home. Um, but I, they they got their COVID under better control than we did, so I yeah. think it's probably safe to assume that they were a little more aggressive with the measures than we were. Uh, um, and the weirdest thing was patient zero for Australia was Tom Hanks. A lot of people may not know, know. that, but <laughs> my body is. Dude, that's my pin tweet. Actually. Is it really? Is it really? My but my my um. It's something like it took Tom Hanks in the NBA for you people to pay attention to this oh, or God. something like that. Uh, one of my, my best friend in the world is a, is like the Today Show uh, host anchor there. And he had to quarantine for two weeks because he interviewed um, I'm, I'm her yeah, name. Rita Wilson. Rita right? Wilson. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, so. So, OK, let me ask you then uh, and I'll let you go because I've taken up way too much of your time. I love talking to you. I'm learning a lot. Uh, but uh, but just about you mentioned Peter, nice. you, uh, you mentioned Peter Hotez and, and vaccine. Um, this is another part of what you study. Uh, what 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 do you. What do you watch as an expert? What are your thoughts? To me, I feel like I don't have to be now, you know, I have an associate's degree and I know that intimidates you. But like my associate's degree informs me that there's a whole bunch of people, Megan, that think JFK Jr. is alive. They're not going to get a vaccine. Like my concern about the vaccine is that people don't get it. Not that we get I lucky. I believe he didn't show up at the rally the other night. There's we... still time. They could change the date. <laughs> Get a rollerblade up. Listen, uh, do you think I'm on board with this just because I'm living near a lighthouse right now? This is not. Sorry. Uh, hey, it, I mean, I couldn't put it past them. me. Era, <laughs> Megan May, you've got to know I'm coming back. Um, my did a Simpsons impression of the Kennedys for JFK Jr.'s ghost. So the point being, no <laughs> yeah, one's getting vaccinated. <laughs> no one's get like yeah. there's too many people that won't trust it. And now you even have the science based people saying. Listen, I've never questioned the experts until now because it's the Trump administration. So it's a weird kind of thing that if he does get reelected, it's not unfair to question his CDC, his NIH, his FDA and all the agencies that are involved with this. That's why another reason why you really hope that science based you know, leaders are in charge here. But what are your what are your thoughts right. about conspiracy theories versus the actual effectiveness of a possible vaccine? Well, the one thing I will say is this is a moment where capitalism is good because I don't for a moment think that Pfizer or J&J &J 
or Eli Lilly or any of those guys are going to put out a vaccine that they have knowledge is either not going to work or is going to get someone sick because they will get sued. So that is the one instance where I'm like, now that, like if Pfizer comes out and says, we're satisfied with these trials, I will be quasi okay with that. Um, So there's um because they have so much to lose it would be such a high exactly. profile drug and failure such a if they spectacular yeah. failure that they would never recover their brand from it well and as so, long as those executives get their first quarter shares uh they don't care what <laughs> happens with the company so uh, in a quarterly capitalist america and world which is what we have especially with a lot of these pharmaceutical companies i still worry that they don't give a shit because as long as they get their golden parachute but i'm a little cynical but I do think, yeah, I mean, that's a good point. So there's, there's 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 definitely some imperfections there. And there were a couple of, um, you know, there were a couple of memes floating around again where people said it's unbelievable that the times we live in are the pharmaceutical companies are the voice of reason. Yeah. And bioethics here. Yeah, um, yeah. that's they, funny. They were, they were like, we're not going to license this without finishing the trials so the trump Um, administration obviously is pressuring them in a way that is unparalleled but they can't it's science is science in terms of vaccine development you can't really rush it you have to test it in people and ultimately trump is the boss of the cdc director he is the The, boss of the fda director he's the boss of the nih director but he is not the boss of pfizer and he is not the boss of j and j and so he um so he he can't much less other international pharmaceutical companies that might develop it as well. Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So any other any European companies, he has nothing to do with them. Right. And so there are reasons that we can take s- certain things and trust that there's not shenanigans with them. Right. Um, so there's that piece. That being said, he's just by trying to, you know, yell a licensed vaccine into existence. He's just (laughs) created this environment. And as 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 you know, I mean, we've talked kind of privately about this, but um, and I know you've talked with Peter Otez about this. This this is a medical intervention that people have a lot of wiggliness about to begin with. Right. And so when you put on top of that, this this person who's essentially saying over his own experts that he hired, you know, they don't know what they're talking about. It's going to be ready. It's going to be ready. It's sort of like they're still enrolling people in trials and a person needs about 14 days to make an antibody response. And then you need several months to show nothing weird happens to them. And you need to, reliably be able to say they probably have been exposed to COVID and not contracted it in that time. So when you like count on your fingers, how many days there are before the election, like it's not possible that that could be put out that like they're, they're, you can yell at somebody's, you know, somebody's B cells all you want. They're not going to make it faster. And so it's, it's not, um, it's not a matter of, people being too fussy or being insubordinate like that th- it, it's just not done yet um what do you say to somebody who says listen i'm you know this uh, i trust science but the science has been wrong uh, on this in terms of the you know the virus the way it spreads whether or not it lives on surfaces how it's contracted masks or no masks kids and how it you know mutate or how it uh it acts in children and and, uh, you know, people hear all kinds of little things that have no idea about how science works. But you're not I'm guessing that you're not surprised about any of it because you understand how research is done and that you take the best uh, consensus on a thing. And then sometimes that changes. But that right. also creates, I guess, some skepticism amongst the I'll say uneducated public. Well, it, it, there's two pieces to that. And then part of it, too, is I think that 
you know, we we talked uh, several months ago about the the kind of the process of science and how it's not something that most people ever have any exposure to. So the idea that someone wouldn't know that 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 all of these revisions uh, and refining of thoughts are totally normal. Um, so somebody not realizing that I, I think is is not, you know, it, it's perfectly understandable. Um, so I, I don't mean that as a critique in any way. It's just if you've never, if this isn't the universe you live in, then why would you know that, right? right? So right. I, I mean, I think it's totally understandable. But that being said, I think there, there's two important pieces that that I think it would help people to keep in mind when they're looking at, well, you said X in January, and now you're saying Y in October, and those things aren't the same, therefore you don't know what you're talking about. Um the first thing is we can't science isn't static, right? So we've, we've known things about um, force uh, for, for hundreds of years. We've known about gravity for hundreds of years. We did not know the force of the earth's gravitational pull mathematically for that entire time. Right. Right. So there's a new discovery and then you use that to make more new discoveries. And the, the, the problem is if that, if you're not kind of steeped in the process of science, you might say, well, everybody knows how gravity works. Well, but when it was first discovered, people really didn't know how it worked. And we learned more things as we went. It's, it's only been like eight months. (laughs) We're not wizards. We're doing our best here. Um, I was told you were. I was told you were, you were a wizard when I first no, reached out I am to a you. Creepy lighthouse keeper. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell if it's getting tedious or it's still funny. It's but funny I- to me. <laughs> it's funny to me. She lives um, right near Lighthouse in Maine, <laughs> folks, and we. It's part of. It's going to be a part of our conversations forever. Um, will you finish I, with that I, point? There was two points. I. I <laughs> There's two parts to that answer. I was wandering towards the next one. Um, (laughs) And then the next one is that sometimes if there's a a really kind of subtle thing, you might not have enough information right away to be able to see it. So uh, the perfect example of this, I think you you mentioned the uh, sickness in kids. And at first we thought they don't seem to get sick with this. And then it's like, well, they might get sick, but it's pretty minor. And then it was, well, now, actually, now that millions of kids have now been infected, we can see that there's this very rare presentation of this multi-system inflammatory syndrome. But it was so rare that it is so rare that when we only had, you know, 100 cases in children, we didn't see it because it hadn't happened yet. And so it looks like people are changing their mind, but really what it is, is we now have enough cases to be able to see really rare minor things. Um, So it's there. I think those two processes, we can't, we, we have to understand that this is a brand new science thing that one year ago, nobody knew existed. And it takes time to understand how something works. And sometimes it looks like, this is the story, but really it's this. And, um, and sometimes there's just the more data you have from having more and more people infected, the more you can see trends that weren't immediately obvious. And I I think that that's why stories do change a little bit. Well, that um, was a very great, understandable explanation for, I think the most important question. And I'll always ask you and other scientists how science is done and why it matters. And I'll leave it there because I know that that. you you have to go change the lighthouse bulb and then (laughs) put your, what kind of pet do lighthouse keepers have? I think some kind of mangy dog. I don't know. That seems the cats? right. The, they have with cats? the cheese in the mouth or something. I don't know. Or is that the pirate dog? I don't, I don't know. know. You're the one who lives don't, right on top of the lighthouse. <laughs> Dr. Megan <laughs> May, everybody. In the room. I don't know. Does that count? <laughs> that, no, that one's yours. You don't live in the lighthouse. Thank you so much for talking to me. I always appreciate it. It's been way too long. Thank you. Absolutely. It was great talking to you, too. All right, there goes Dr. Megan May, Dr. May Five on Twitter. Follow her there. Thank you for joining me here. Thank you for all of your support. 
on the podcast. Go give it a rating. Go tell your friends and go join us on the Discord platform once you become a subscriber. Or let's meet up on Thursday night for the debate. We'll have a hangout there. You can find the link at patreon.com slash Pete Dominic once you are a subscriber and then sign up for the Discord chat as well. And I look forward to seeing you there because you know that way you are never alone. Okay, yesterday's show ended on a song submitted to me by Phil Round, who's a listener and subscriber, and it was hilarious and great. And today it's Kyle Galen and the band Lady Claire's. The song is American Now, and tomorrow we'll hear one from John Carroll. Take it away, Kyle. This one time in the land of free electoral calamity Two pandemics stacked and soon combined to form a tragedy While you're stuck in quarantine, stuck in hydroxychloroquine Sipping Lysol cocktails through your teeth all while injecting bleach all day To keep the wolves away Oh, by the way did your master say? Because he says one day it's not a threat The next impending certain death Depends on just what time of day you catch him And what mood he's in then Morning he's a dissident By evening wartime president Our enemy cruel and silent Three hookers later he forgets its name Find someone else to blame Cause they downplayed him Then he does the same Through this crisis He acts like a surprise kid Admires his rank on Facebook While the death toll rises to fame and anti-science But you'll swear by anything If somehow we survive this Such is our America now So say a prayer for Prophet QAnon Aware of the mission that he's on Bit sick liberals be gone Save the kids they're praying on Curse the liars at the news It's hurtful, biased, and untrue A pizza gate they won't tell you While they inflate the China flu for pay Put puppets in their play For shame Liberal cabal games Recite cable news Cause someone's gonna come for you It's true Though it's not clear who or just what they'll do They'll probably have pitchforks and axes I bet they'll take your guns and raise your taxes too Unless you don't work and just watch cable news So stir fears above the coming hell To all the dumb and white and frail But all shortcomings that they feel Threats far more perceived than real Conflating Dems with anarchists Empowering white supremacists Engaging in race baiting And abetting domestic terrorists for play With ARs and their AKs But hey If they're white then they're Fractured nation with cracks in the foundation And each news briefing a form of public masturbation Flood the zone with shit and get Steve Bannon's finest course in mass manipulation 
while our democratic norms go spiraling down. So look around, where is your American 